timestamps can be found in the description. Welcome back, everybody. I got a brand new one for you guys. Today we're talking about Barbarian, which I went to go see with my friend, who you can find his channel for right here. It's Big Bruiser Gaming, my buddy Jacoby. Great content. Go check it out if you want a couple of good scares. I could not recommend it more. At least two-thirds of this film is edge of your seat. What's going to happen next? And that is what a lot of films in 2022 have been struggling to kind of pull off or horror films have been trying to pull off is just like keeping people on edge. And it almost wasn't made, apparently. Supposedly, this uh, the director who's from The Whitest Kids You Know, apparently he went two years trying to find a company that would greenlight him because certain things in the film had never like really been done. So a lot of people were kind of cautious about how that was going to work. But let's jump into it. Hold on one moment. Let me get the quick summary. Let's get it. A young woman discovers the rental home she booked is already occupied by a stranger. Against her better judgment, she decides to spend the night, but soon discovers there's a lot more to fear than just an unexpected house guest. This film pulls in so many different ways in the beginning. They had Bill Skarsgård play the person well, well, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it. <laughs> Let's jump right into the wiki and we'll break it down whenever we get there. It's relatively short, so we shouldn't have too many breaks in between. Tess Marshall books a remote home in a rundown neighborhood while staying in Detroit for a job interview. She is surprised to find the house is already occupied by a young man named Keith, who rented the property through a different app. But with a storm raging outside and no hotel vacancies, Tess finds herself with no option but to spend the night in the house. Initially, Tess is unnerved by Keith's awkward and strange behavior, but she eventually warms up to him. That night, she notices her bedroom door has been opened and hears some moving around the house. She then sees Keith shaking and making strange sounds in his sleep. She then finds Keith shaking and making strange sounds in his sleep, so she goes to wake him. After another awkward encounter, Tess returns to her room and falls asleep. So this film opens up with a heavy rainfall as a woman's pulling in trying to use her Airbnb app to find the location of this home. Uh, it's really dark out, so she can't really tell any of the neighboring houses how they look. She pulls up to the lo she pulls up to the location. It keeps showing her phone. Somebody keeps trying to hit her up and like asking where she is. It seems like she's fighting with somebody. That's all you really get from that. She's trying. She's pretty much ignoring somebody trying to talk to her. She gets the. She finally gets to the location. Uh, pushes the code in wrong. Has to run back to her card. Get the right numbers. Come back types in the code correctly and there's suddenly then there is no key to be found she kind of gets annoyed kind of freaking out a little bit goes back to her car and the second she hops into her car you find that there is a light on she makes her way to the front door and begins banging banging on it and no one seems to answer for a while until Bill Skarsgård answers the front door. When Pennywise answers the front door, you're automatically they're using the they're using him as a free, uh, pretty much a free. Don't trust this guy just because of what he's played in the past and how he comes off. He comes off extremely awkward, and they have a very like contested almost relationship in the very beginning of this film where she's being extremely careful she's making sure not she's not drinking anything she he puts in front of her he she uh finds his wallet in her in the in the room where he uh pretty much eventually allows her to take him trying to be an extremely like nice host if you will uh it says i'll take the i'll take the living room like i understand uh have the room with the lock on it it's completely fine uh he offers to make her tea she doesn't drink it he waits for her to get out of the shower before he opens the wine uh and wants her to know I mean, he explains it very overly overly cautious he's like i want to make sure you see me open it so you know i'm not doing anything to it uh and just tries to pretty much converse talk her into remaining calm like not thinking he's a threat eventually they start to get a little bit more friendly with one another, one another almost like a will they won't they by the end of the night uh because she's 
She realizes he's famous by either a band or some sort of wine connoisseur. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it was a band. I'm not sure. He pretty much, they buddy buddy by the end of the night. <clears throat> As she finally falls asleep, she, once again, like it said, wakes to hear the door opening, which everyone in the theater is immediately like, okay, uh, I guess it's starting off quick. Uh, as she sits up in her bed, she looks out to see he's still asleep on the couch. He's kind of shaking like he's having some sort of nightmare. She walks out, wakes him up, scares him, and he's kind of upset, like, what are, what are you doing? She's like, did you open my room? He says, no, definitely not. And she goes back to bed for the night. Yeah, we'll jump to the next paragraph. That's pretty much fine. The next morning, Tess awakens to find that Keith has left the house for the day. She goes to her job interview and is warned that, that the neighborhood where she is staying is unsafe. Upon returning, she is chased inside by a homeless man who demands that she leave the house. Needing to use the bathroom, Tess searches the residence for a roll of toilet paper. She ventures into the basement and accidentally locks herself inside. Searching for a way out, Tess stumbles across a hidden door in the basement, being freed by Keith after he returns. When she tells Keith what she has seen, he ventures down to the basement to investigate. When he doesn't return, Tess goes down after him and discovers another subterranean tunnel leading further under the house. Following Keith's scream, Tess finds him claiming that there is someone in the tunnel who bit him. As Tess panics, a large, naked, deformed female suddenly attacks the pair and brutally kills Keith, repeatedly smashing his head into the walls of the tunnel. This lead-up, every scene involving the tunnels and underground is amazing. Every scene involving underneath the house is so good and well-lit and just everything you want. From a horror movie especially the suspense leading up to these big bad situations it's so good um but it's pretty much nailed everything on the head uh she wakes up in the morning there's a small note keith saying make sure you leave the make sure you leave the key out for me uh i'll be back uh i'll be back tonight and it's still kind of hinting towards the fact that he could be a bad dude Whenever she gets home from her interview, or she goes to the interview, sorry, and the person who's lived in Chicago, or sorry, lived in Detroit a long time, she tells her the name of the location, and she's like, hey, that's not a good neighborhood. Like, I don't know what you're, don't stay there. She's like, it wasn't that bad. It was like, it was night when she left. She's starting to realize on her ride back that there are a lot of decrepit homes, a lot of them that didn't survive the, uh, the automotive fail in Detroit. Fail, failure in Detroit, doesn't matter. She gets home, needs to use the restroom. As, after she gets done to use the restroom, she realizes that there's no toilet paper there. Uh-oh, SpaghettiOs. She then ventures throughout the house and tries to find toilet paper and has to go downstairs. The second she walks downstairs, the door seems to close behind her. Now, this was just a random happenstance. There's actually no tie to this in the film. It just seems that there's like a creaky door that always closes. And it locks from the outside. Uh, as she panics and tries to figure out what's going on, she moves a small toy, and there seems to be a rope. She begins to pull a rope and sees that there's a, a sectioning in her wall that moves and opens to show these underground tunnels. And immediately, she acts like a normal freaking person would. Says, nope, sits on the thing, can kind of just waits for someone to get there. But eventually she kind of looks around and finds a mirror which she uses to use the use the uh, the hang down light and kind of bounce that down the hallway so she can see so she can see what's down there as she walks a little bit further she walks into this uh she walks into this location as she turns to see a what can only be described as a smut location to where you can see there's only a bed some blood on the wall in the bed and a camera when she's down there they do a quick jump scare of somebody uh, knocking on the front door she runs out there's a small window beneath the basement area she begins to hammer on it to try to get keith to notice her he does and this is a scene where you're kind of like if he's bad he's just gonna leave her here and he has her what she he has what he wants but once again they tease that of like all right you push this way i'll pull this way Kind of, 
keep hinting at the fact that any of any of the things he's saying could be played as a villain. He gets her out, gets the key, gets inside, and she's beginning to pack up, saying, no, I gotta go. There's some sort of horrible chamber down there. We don't need to go anywhere near here. He walks downstairs, asks her to hold the door open for him so it doesn't close and lock him down there, which still is a red flag, begins to walk downstairs, and never returns. She begins to freak out, places something in front of the door, walks downstairs, she shouts for him. She's beginning to hear sounds further down the tunnels, pretty much saying, Tess, help, Tess, come here. As she walks a little bit further into the tunnel and sees that there's another set of, there's another door at the very end of it. As she pushes to see that there are stairs that go even further down. She's really not having it, but she's hearing sounds of Keith shouting further down as she walks downstairs. As she walks downstairs, it's, it's creepy, man. It is dark. As she walks, she's beginning to see things like small cages on the right-hand side of her. She walks a little bit further down. She sees Keith running for his life, gets finds her and she's like hey no we can't we can't go that way and he points behind her to where she was running she came from upstairs she said something bit me and it was from that way she's like no this is the only way out we just got here I'm like i just got here and this was the way i came from it's like no she came it came from that way something bit me and it's as quick as he said something bit me you see a mouth formed very hills have eye s creature run towards him grab his head and just bash into the wall and that's a hard cut we then cut to two weeks later a sitcom actor aj learns he has been fired from a show due to a sexual assault i don't think we're gonna stick with it i'm probably gonna get whatever for it you can't say it so we're gonna say sexual assault we know we mean something else. It starts, it's not, it's grapes without the G. Sexual assault allegations by a co-star. Pressure to sell his assets to pay for his legal costs. He travels to one of his rental, rental properties in Detroit, intending to sell it. It is revealed to be the same house where Tess and Keith were staying. AJ finds their belongings still in the house, assuming the residence has attracted squatters. He searches for them, but to no avail. He then goes out drinking with a friend, where he unconvincingly explains that his co-star consented to having sex with him. Quick sum of this. They get uh, Justin Long in. This was what a lot of people were saying, or... Uh, this is what some of the things online were saying that he was turned down for because introducing somebody so into like I think they said page 50 aka halfway during the halfway through the movie is very not frowned upon but most people won't connect with a new character and he said there's a reason this guy's not a good dude and in fact uh, AJ is kind of battling this throughout the entire film Pretty much he gets a call from his lawyers halfway down this drive, down the strip in this nice car as he pretty much says, hey, the Hollywood Express, I can't think of what it's called, Hollywood Times, doesn't matter, is going to be posting, uh, is going to be posting these allegations on Tuesday. Also, the sitcom wants you out. Turns out uh, sexual assault is a very major thing and you're pretty much saying his career is over. He goes to his account to where the gentleman pretty much says, "All right, tell me all the, tell me all how much you're going to be spending this month." He's like, "Well, you're going to be out of money in the next four months. Also, I'm giving your papers back on Friday. I'm not going to represent a uh, a sexual assaulter." Him panicking, pretty much, uh, he was given two options, which was sell his home there in L.A. And he said, what about the rental properties? I have a bunch of rental properties up in Detroit. So he books it there. When he gets there, he gets a phone call or he at some point in time gets a phone call from his parents. He doesn't tell them where he is. They live in Detroit. Doesn't matter. It's a small little nod to saying, hey, this dude's lying to his closest of people. Uh, and even his parents aren't kind of believing that he, he might not be in the right here. He finds her laptop he finds her car out front he thinks he has squatters he goes in kind of freaking out 
When he goes out drinking with his friend, he definitely admits to sexual assault. Like, he, and this is, once again, this is quotes from the film. Do not take this out of context. Uh, AJ says, well, you know, they start saying no, and by the end of it, it's, it's, it's real scummy. Like, you do not want to like this person. And there, there's points behind the movie that would make sense. I'd, I would rather you look it up on your own because talking about it on YouTube is always kind of weird. But he pretty much admits to sexual assault. Uh, and it's not, it's the other word that we can't really say on YouTube. Um, next paragraph. Upon drunkenly returning back to the house, AJ inspects the basement and discovers the hidden floor and the tunnel. I'm going to cut it right there because it's a great little... I say great. It shows how shitty this person is, how shitty AJ is, because he immediately from finding out that there's a finding out that there's a basement, you see him pick up his phone and you think he's going to be like uh calling 911 or checking like missing persons, anything like that. And instead he's looking to see if uh pretty much under <laughs> underground dwellings can be added to a property's retail value. And it's so it's just just a spotlight on this person is shitty. Don't like this person. Begins measuring the uh, the entryway. He even finds the smut room and and gets the dimensions of that room. He goes a little bit further down the hall, finds the next door, and immediately says "sweet" and keeps using this tape measure to see how much range he has. Oh, it's brilliant. Oh, it's so good. Um. All right, back to this. He finds a room containing a television playing a video about breastfeeding newborn children before being chased by a deformed woman. Fleeing, he falls into a pit alongside a still-alive Tess. She tells AJ to stay calm and that the woman in the tunnel, referred to as the mother, wants them to act as her children. The mother forces Tess to drink milk from a bottle and tends to her. When AJ refuses, the mother drags him away to the TV room and forces him to breastfeed. It was so gross, but it's one of the cringiest part of the film. And besides that, like, there's not a lot of like gross to it, to the movie. Tess takes the opportunity to flee the basement and narrowly escapes the house with the help of Andre, the homeless man that she she was chased by earlier. Orange Andre warns her to leave the neighborhood before it gets dark, as the mother goes out hunting at night, and berates her for wanting to go back to save AJ. Tess attempts to explain the situation to a pair of uh, to a pair of incredulous policemen, but they don't believe her. She's been down there for two weeks. She looks gross. She's covered in dirt and just grime. She looks like a junkie, which they do an excellent job for makeup to show that, of course, the policemen are dealing with a lot of things right now, but a strange woman running up to her, running up to them and like freaking out, she looks like a druggie. So they're not like necessarily believing her. She takes them back to the house. All they see is a broken window and she doesn't have a key or an ID on her because they're still in the house. So they do a great job with that uh, small thing that apparently had been pointed out. Uh, all horror movies have this. All movies have this to where people were saying, why didn't she just why didn't she just go into the house? They have to go in and get her. It's a B&E at that point. Or why didn't she hit the car? Them not knowing that it's hers. Either way, she would have been taken away safely. It's pretty much showing that she just wants to save AJ. That is what the entire thing is. She wants to be a good person. She saw a good person die and is assuming that AJ is another renter. And so she wants to protect and save him. They do a great job with the mother. She looks gross, but it's an excellent job. When she gets out of the house, using the distraction of the mother taking away AJ, she gets out of the house. The homeless man that chased her down originally pulls her out says hey get out of here she she leaves the house at dark and she uh she's not even the worst thing down there besides that it pretty much covers everything except for uh it the, when it mentions the room there is just a pink room where it seems the mother stays and it has a video on how to be how to breastfeed running on loop it seems to be that this is all this woman's ever been able to watch uh he says that woman's been down there for 40 years years. A flashback to the 1980s shows the house's original owner, Frank, 
who stalked and abducted young women and held them captive in the tunnels, assaulting them and raising the, su and raising the subsequent children. Back to the present while attempting to escape, AJ finds a room that the mother is seemingly afraid of. He finds a vegetable Frank as, as well as dozens of videotapes of Frank assaulting different women. AJ unintentionally gives Frank access to a gun, which Frank uses to complete suicide. Taking the gun, AJ ventures back into the tunnel. Night falls, and the mother leaves the house to hunt down Tess. Tess, waiting in her car for the mother to leave the house, runs her over, pinning her to the house and seemingly killing her. Tess returns to the basement tunnel to find AJ, only to be accidentally shot by him in the darkness. The two escape the house with Frank's gun in tow. It pretty much covers everything except for, uh... During the flashback sequence, Frank mentions the fact that I'm never leaving. I'm not going to leave this neighborhood, no matter what. I'm not leaving no matter what, which is hinted to, and then he goes to the room and sees Frank. They do an excellent shot of a, a, the tunnels being darkly lit and the mother beginning to walk forward from the very peak of, or the very edge of darkness, seeing that he's on the, seeing that he's at the father's door. She backs away. He goes into the room. Frank's not able to say anything, but he keeps pointing over. And he's like, do you want water? And he like shoves it out the way, barely. And he keeps pointing. And eventually, he just and he moves the entire nightstand over to him, where he reaches in, pulls out a revolver, and turns it on himself. This is only after AJ mentions that uh, it's okay, man. I'm gonna get you out of here. I'm gonna call the police. They're gonna take this. They're gonna take this girl down. It's gonna be fine. And he starts watching he watches a video they don't show it during the flashback sequence it shows frank hunting down a woman in a flowery dress you see the flowery dress in his room and it's assumed that this the mother is probably an offspring of them uh final paragraph upon oh yeah uh we'll we'll cut back to that aj's freaking out leaving with the gun looking for the mother the mother is outside pinned against the wall shoots tess and immediately almost a light version of victim blaming as he's like what are you doing uh i'm sorry i thought i thought you and just pretty much like trying to come off as like i wasn't on purpose uh, i didn't do it on kind of what this character is all about at this point it seems as he shoots her they begin to make their way out of the house and this will come up to our final paragraph here on wiki Upon exiting, upon exiting the residence, they find that the mother has freed herself from the car. And unfortunately for me, they bring it up. It should have been something good for the crowd to be able to find out for themselves and kind of see it. But that's one of my, my few picks at the movie. Um, and by the way, this is where that two-thirds that I was talking about at the very beginning begins to tail off because they're outside. It's... It's night, sure, but it's still, it's not an unknown area to us. It's out in the streets of the U.S. Like, upon exiting the residence, they find that the mother has freed herself from the car. Andre finds the pair, takes them to his hideout, and, exp and explains that the mother is the product of decades of assault, which we know the word, it's, it's great without the G, and incest they do a quick thing to where he said pretty much they didn't originally have him explaining anything and instead they do a voiceover for him to where they're kind of getting like out shots and he's saying it's she's the she's she's the product of what happens when you make a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy for 40 years which is a excellent quick description of this character of this of this monster in 20 seconds it's so good he also says uh, i've been living here beside the water tower for 15 years and she's never been over and the second he says this she breaks through the wall like the kool-aid man oh yeah <laughs> And she ambushes the group, violently kills Andre by ripping off his arm, which was kind of a cheap kill for me because everything else has been very real and like very, very gritty and made sense. This was kind of like it went B horror for just a quick second as she rips his arm off and beats him to death with his own arm. I guess because he's been helping her babies or touching her babies, which is so ugh before chasing Tess and AJ up the water tower. As they begin to sprint, AJ drops the gun, keeps running, and this is where 
AJ AJ's been battling this thing for like the that this final little half. It's like maybe I'm maybe I'm a bad guy. I don't want to be a bad guy. But the second that it becomes life or death, he immediately at the very top he's like We've got to get out of here, but you have to slow her down and pushes her ass off the top of this water tower. And unfortunately, they do use the weird camera shot for the monster as the mother jumps after Tess. And it shows this weird undercut where it's not very flattering. They're just like trying to reach out to save her child. AJ pushes Tess off the water tower to distract the mother. The mother jumps after Tess, shielding her from the fall. As AJ makes his way down there, he notices that the mother has her cradled. A freaking AJ has been shot. She's fallen off of like a 30 foot water tower, at least 30 feet. AJ attempts to apologize to a gravely wounded Tess as he's kind of like, oh, you must have fell. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must have slipped. It's like, oh, you are the worst guy. You are the worst. But they do it right because you're never supposed to be pro that guy like it's great the mother regains consciousness and puts her thumbs in aj's eyes as you see eye jelly just bleep, as she crushes his skull or uh, splits his skull in half she attempts to bring tess back to the house to nurse her but tess takes the gun that aj picked up on his way down as you almost feel bad for the mother as she kind of like kisses her hands and puts it on top of the puts it on top of Tess's forehead as Tess pulls the trigger you we all knew that the mother would never survive in in 2022 it makes sense they killed her off there's rumors that they might do a prequel but he apparently he really doesn't want to follow Frank as just the worst kind of guy uh with the mother finally dead, Tess stumbles away, bloody and traumatized. And that's the wiki plot, along with my commentary. Uh, let's jump into the ratings. Now, I've been, I've been struggling with what I want to give this one, to be honest. After some deliberation, let's go through the plot. The plot itself I found very interesting and two thirds of the way through. The second that they leave the tunnels, a lot is taken away. You're not in an unknown area. There's not a lot of sharp turns. It's not extremely dark. You're not in an area that is unknown to us, but is well known to the monster, which puts us on the back foot no matter what. Uh, with the line, uh, she's not the worst thing down there. It kind of led to the fact that there could be more people down there, minus just the dad who, of course, is a bad guy, but he, of course, nobody's seen him in 15-plus years and is a vegetable. So I think they could have done a little bit more with that. I think the story itself is good. I'm going to give the story or the plot an 8. I think it could have... I think I deducted points for the two-third, that last little third that weakened it a little bit for me, but I did enjoy the story. I did. I did enjoy... The, the final girl and the, the pretty much what she had to go through and learning like she was extremely <clears throat> she was extremely cautious in the beginning but immediately afterwards jumped to assuming all men are like that apparently all men aren't and betrayal they show uh aj trying to be a good guy not trusting the mother immediately turns away whenever she's trying to do anything not harmful to him but the second she he finds the father he's immediately like yo bro that bitch is crazy uh we're gonna get out of here and it shows a great dynamic between like character evolution and and de-evolution as well i'm giving it 8.25 because that final end does weigh it down a little bit for me but it was still an amazing story i think they did a great job with it the looming threat anytime you were underneath the home it came off so so threatening <laughs> so scary and i don't use that word you know flippantly i'll give the threat of this once again the two-thirds definitely has to the final third has to kind of has to weigh into it i'll give the threat 
I'll give the threat a seven on this one, just because just because the amount of red herrings kind of weighed it down for me, but I thought it was really well done. Don't take the seven as that, just, I don't know how I can phrase it properly to make it feel like I'm defending it more than I am, but I think a seven is fair for the threat here. Gares, I'll actually do this. I'll give the threat an eight. I'll give the scares a six. A six or a five, because I think the overall looming threat was great. But there was, they used a tape measure as a jump scare. That was a clever one. Uh, they used the quick motion of uh, her pretty much hunting or using the tape measure to find AJ. Very interesting. Uh, very well, I should say. They used that very well. Uh, they used the kind of cringe gore fact, gore, cringe factor of him having to breastfeed off for very well. I don't think it's scary. I think it was more threatening. So I'll give the threat an eight and I'll give the scares a five on this. There wasn't a ton of scares, but I will absolutely admit that the overall looming threat was fantastic throughout it. This puts me at a predicament because I have to look at it as a whole now. Is it newbie approved? No, there is nudity, of course. Uh, for some pretty gruesome gore, some kind of laughable gore with the arm rip. So it's not recommended for newbies, but do I recommend this film? I plan on buying it for Voodoo. I do believe this is a good film and I do praise it and I will recommend it. Uh, as for the final score of the movie, I will give it a 7.25. I thought it was a good film overall. I thought some of the things that it put forward were great. I cannot wait to see what another uh, great sit uh, not sitcom skit comedian can do with uh, with with horror. I'm excited, but I'm going to give it a 7.25 just because that final third. And I know I've said it a hundred times. I feel like it falls off and I think they could have done more with the underground and they could have kept the entire film under there. I think it would have went really good. Give me one more major turn. And I think we had a 9 or a 10 there. But that's my thoughts on Barbarian. I know I don't share the same thoughts as uh, Jacoby on this, so if you ever want comment on some of his videos, ask him what he thought about, Bar about Barbarian. Be sure to like some of his videos, subscribe to him. While you're here, subscribe to me. Why not? Leave a like on the video if you liked my take on this or not. Comment and tell me how wrong I am. That's all I got for you guys today. I hope you enjoyed this review. I kind of ran really long with it, but I think a film like this deserve to be deserves to be talked about as much as possible. Hope you all have a great day. Take care. Stay scared, guys. See ya.